we're going from the creative to the data lens. So we're gonna do a hard left turn at Albuquerque <laughs> here. Uh, ben Magnuson is our resident Chicago fanatical sports fan. Very deeply troubled and always pained, but he's always <laughs> optimistic about that. I'm a Packers fan, so that's why I can dig at Ben a little bit. Uh, but Ben runs our data strategy team. He makes data exciting and interesting, and I always love hearing him speak because he takes a different spin on how he makes things applicable and relevant to what we're trying to solve. So, ladies and gentlemen, Ben. ben. Thanks, Bill. Pained and angry. <laughs> so Jessica seemed like she uncovered a lot of Project Runway fans. Are there any Bar Rescue fans in the audience? <laughs> Let's go. So if you haven't seen it, um, it's my entire presentation. But <laughs> it's a surly man who goes to these hapless run bars and just berates them uh, for their incompetence. But my favorite part is when he'll start to ask them, you know, basic questions upon seeing the chaos in their books, like, what's your labor costs? What's your cost of goods sold? What's your waste? And they're just weeping and crying, be like, I don't even know what those words are. And so I think that's a good illustration for how often data is seen as a way to organize through chaos. It gives us our foundation to move forward. So it's with that that uh, I've been following with concern a trend for the last couple of years where there's been uh, a real degradation of the quality of specifically consumer data. So while on one track, data transformation has made organizational data often better, broken down a lot of silos, made it more impactful. I think 10 years ago, if we would have talked about the trajectory of how we can track and create relevance for consumers, that it was, uh, it was limitless, right? It was only going to get better and reach that ideal of no waste and only the perfect message reaching the right customer. And I think Kevin's gonna talk about how that promise is kind of broken. And a lot of the reasons why it's broken was due to abuse and misuse, um, taking advantage of people's trust, much like Michael J. Fox in Back to the Future trying to seduce his mom before realizing the impacts. <laughs> this whole speech is gonna be about analogies, so I started with a, a good one. So um, <laughs> on one side of it, on the data collection side, it, was, uh, it, it changed due to regulations entering, uh, specifically GDPR came into place, uh, CPPA, that sounds wrong, I think I did that wrong, CCPA. All right, um, and then there's also private companies, Apple uh, putting their Ask app not to track, reduced a lot of the ability to track consumers across the internet, and browsers started to say, we're not gonna give you all this information. So in that sense, it was specific intervention. But another one that I've been really more concerned with is survey-based research has been struggling with declining response rates that have no end in sight. I love surveys. Every, the first Friday of every month, I'm waiting for the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Give me that jobs report number. I like to follow polls. I like everything. And I still follow them. We know that they still have a lot of value, but there's this harbor, I don't know the word, harbinger of doom? I don't practice before I come up here. Um, that this is eventually gonna hit a place where they might not be able to provide much insight. Whenever I talk about this, you know, cause this is a complicated problem. There's a coordination problem here, right? There's a lot of bad actors taking advantage of people's trust and time within their own personal devices. There's a consumer behavior change. There's technology issues. And whenever you talk about difficult problems nowadays, I feel like you get uh, a certain type of person that asks, have you considered how AI will solve this problem yet? <laughs> and now for many of you, you're in organizations that have been using AI in a lot of different capacities. So you know, from quality control to fraud detection, it's a part of it. Uh, but certainly the recent advances and the ability to process so much information, relatively cheaper, uh, and the new models has caught our attention. And in that face of suddenly difficult problems that aren't as familiar um, and new technologies that we're trying to match together, I think it's really common to try and think of, well, maybe we should be asking the specialists in that industry to kind of show us our way out. 
And I have concerns about that. Um, I took this from, uh, it's actually a very nice article. It's written from an AI researcher to future AI researchers on how to break into it. So I'm not criticizing them. But it caught my eye for a certain type of tendency where you read this, it's the most important trait of an AI researcher is that they know a lot about AI research. They should know, they should have some breadth. And that breadth consists of all sub-disciplines within AI. Um, to me, that's not breadth. That's the opposite of breadth. That is a pretty narrow focus. And when we're thinking about of AI, it's a lot of applying it to very broad questions, many different types of industries, and things that you're going to need a lot of different perspectives for to really unlock the power there. So today, uh, I'm going to talk about how I read a book once. The book is Range. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this book holds a special place in my heart. When any of my new employees start, I hand them a copy. Um, it, I, I encourage, has anyone read this book? Good. I, my nightmare was that everyone raises their hand. <laughs> and then I just Charlie Brown walk off the stage like, I got nothing for you guys. Um, it's a wonderful book and I'm only gonna, I'm, I'm gonna pull a lot from it, but it covers so much of, I take insight on how to raise my kids. Um, I, I don't know why I stopped there. There's a lot more that I use it for. So it really captures how to utilize range and defines it. Um, if you go back to college speech, the T-shaped person, the ability to pull from your range across just your specialty, but also gives tools how to utilize it, right? You may not have that many experiences. You might prefer a more narrow outlook. Well, it gives us different approaches and shows us how to build those teams. So I'm gonna focus on those three different areas, how we can use our experiences to help us better answer and predict in the future um, the best strategy forward. Second, how to build out our approach so we can utilize that. And then third, the benefits of cross-disciplinary teams, which is conveniently how One North builds itself. So we're gonna start with a story. You may guess these are about two athletes, but the first one is about a wunderkind. Every word I say sounds wrong. Uh, child prodigy. <laughs> Starting at the age of three, he's playing the sport. By the age of four, his father's taken him to uh, where the sport is located. I don't want to give too much yet. He's playing older people constantly and beating them. He's the classic dominant force that blows through the amateur circuit before completely uh, taking it to adults and becoming one of the greatest golfers alive. I'll just, it's Tiger Woods. <laughs> so I've known this story for so long, uh, probably immediately when I got, people love to share this story. And I think it uh, captures this idea that this is what it takes to be on top. That if you wanted to be the best, it took the grit to practice when no one, when other kids were on their bikes, he was out at the golf course, right? That you need to focus, you need to put in your 10,000 hours. But there's another story who, of a contemporary of his in a different sport that wanted to be a professional soccer player, football player, loved soccer, refused to specialize specifically in tennis, despite it being a sport that people do specialize in very early. Florida has, Miami has an academy where they start at 11 years old and uh, the best in the world are there by 16. He didn't specialize specifically in tennis until he was 17, reached equal heights to Tiger Woods. And I think when people hear that story, they think, well, he was just this tennis player. He was just a born and bred tennis player that just took him a while to get there. And I love it for a couple different reasons to think about this because uh, that's not what I take away from this, but not what the book argues. This comes from range. He was a great tennis player because he focused on soccer and tennis. And the reason why that was so much more impactful is because if you think about these two different sports, golf is not known for being easy. However, you do get to place the ball. You do get to start with the ball wherever you want. You decide that. There's wind. There's things like that. Tennis features, always on the run. You have an opponent. They're constantly increasing the speed, which when they hit the ball, they're dealing with different surfaces, different weather, different physics. That is a much more unkind environment, right? You don't get to control much there. You have to deal with a lot more variables. And it's that experience that he can bring from a different sport where he just learns how to teach his body to adjust quickly to different inputs that matter to being the best in the world at tennis. So the bigger, uh, you know, the, sorry, the takeaway for me is that so often when you think about people in the height of their powers, it's the Taylor Swift model, it's the Tiger Woods model that you can easily pick 
with your uh, available examples. But that's really a lie. Uh, you know, I was looking at this this weekend. These are four great examples of people that specialize late. So the argument here is not going to be that specialization itself is poor, but it's that the, those that were able to specialize late after sampling a number of different um, either jobs or hobbies really had an advantage in that they were able to find those patterns which others may not be able to uncover because they were so focused on a specific one. So here's four here. I was thinking of it this weekend. I consider myself somewhat of a data person. I'm like, four examples over 200 years is not that impressive. Um, but then I opened up, I get the weekend Wall Street Journal. Thank you, again. Um, I read every once in a while. And every week it has those that passed away that may have been uh, important to their industries. This past weekend, Jim Simons, who was a dead, uh, famous trader, um, read through the bio, I was familiar with him a little bit, but didn't start his trading firm until he was well into his 40s. He was a mathematician, or was math professor, um, and dabbled in a number of different industries. Wasn't even particularly successful his first 10 years before basically creating quantitative trading and finding patterns where previous traders just uh, took it up to chaos, right? There was another example, but I can't change my deck after Saturday and it was on the weekend, so I can't remember. She, she was impressive, I'll tell you that. This is how we build our teams too. We specifically look for this. I don't know if any of you have ever talked to Kalev, uh, but he has a historian background and um, he will correct you for all of your slides. Uh, <laughs> But I'm going to focus on my team. Um, specifically within data, it's, it's really hard to push back on the forces of specializing within a specific tool, within a specific area. Uh, I've really tried to recruit people that come from different backgrounds and, and are now seeing the power of what can happen when they start to focus on um, bringing data to different management styles, to different operations. And it takes a lot longer, as we'll talk about. but um, at this point, uh, see the benefits of it, I'm not going to change. So it's cool that people can be successful, right? But what is the actual benefit that they're bringing? Par uh, what was it? Famous essay by Isaiah Berlin, bringing the hedgehog and fox, which looking at Kalev, he didn't create, but it was from a Greek philosopher from a lot longer before. Hedgehog, right? One big idea. Fox dabbles in many different types of ideas. So the hedgehog would view everything through their single lens, um, while the fox just kind of takes things as they go. Philip Tetlock decided to apply this to forecasting. So he broke people down into two different cognitive styles, this hedgehog, uh, which he's not particularly favorable to. Um, so he says, hedgehogs toil devotedly within one tradition of their specialty and reach for formulaic solutions to ill-defined problems. Not particularly flattering, but you know, hedgehogs can be founders, right, visionaries within any one field. Um, however, he's particularly looking at it for forecasting, which is if you go and ask someone that's really um, had a lifetime in an industry what's going to happen next, he wanted to measure how accurate they were, especially compared to the foxes, those which are just have a broader range of interests and just are interested in uh, not one particular area. And what he found was that the foxes were particularly, they were destroying the hedgehogs in this. And it caught the eye of IARPA, which is um, an agency similar to DARPA. And they launched this four-year prediction tournament. They invited Tetlock to participate. They were allowed to create these different groups of researchers and encouraged them to formulate um, teams specifically to answer questions that were hard, that would predict the near and medium-term future. So they obviously, uh, based off their previous research, created this team full of foxes. And in year one, they destroyed those that were um, collections of people within agencies that had classified information that were the classic hedgehogs. By year two, uh, he decided to change things up. He took his different, uh, he broke them up into different groups and encouraged them to, one, create their different um, predictions, but then coordinate with each other to see if they could learn anything from each other. By that point, they were winning so badly that you'll notice there's no year three or four on this. They had won, they eliminated anyone else except this group of foxes. This is a quote from Range. The volunteers drawn from the general public beat experienced intelligence analysts with access to classified data by 30%. 
That part is what I find particularly interesting. They weren't just beating someone within a specialist, but they actually had access to better data on what should happen, and they still couldn't compete with those. So why? So we're going to talk about the approach that people that can draw from a wide range of, of uh, experiences can bring to the table. And uh, this is a favorite of the book, Johannes Kepler, a 16th century astronomer, relatively nameless. I'll say that because I have to read his name every time. I've forgotten. I've done this like a thousand times, and I can only be like, he's no Galileo. I'll tell you that much. Um, <laughs> but I love to think about him, uh, to think about the world he lived in. So they had a little bit of structure, right? We're not in the you know, all the planets revolve around Earth. They knew that planets were orbiting around the sun at this point, uh, and they hired him to join a lab where he would measure where the planets were in relation to where they were the previous day, figuring out their speed and orbit. And what he does is observes that planets farther away from the sun are moving slower, which does not mesh with the existing theory that, you know, try to put yourself in the place of these uh, researchers at the time, they don't know why these planets are moving. It's a far off place. They assume that the planets have some agency of their own and are just on some sort of track, causing them to move. But he's like, that doesn't make any sense. Why would they be slowing down? Are they sad? Uh, that's, that's my own. So instead, he thinks, all right, well, maybe it's not that the planets have agency. Maybe it's that uh, the sun is what is creating some of this power and thinks, what are some things that have energy source that dissipate at further distances? So he then moves and relates it to heat and smell. Then he thinks that's not quite right because you can observe heat and smell along the path. Then he thinks about it in terms of light. But with light, um, he notices that doesn't impact anything during an eclipse. So then he moves on to magnets. He hypothesizes they might have poles on either end and it's a push-pull the further it gets away from the sun. And then it's a whirlpool. Maybe it's like a current. With no tools, no theory to work with, but just what he can observe, he basically creates uh, a very similar theory to gravitational pull and in, in how the planets really orbit. So this comes from the book. His intellectual wanderings trace a staggering journey from this planets imbued with souls, riding on crystalline spheres, to laws of planetary motion, which showed their orbits were predictable. And in that process, he invented astrophysics. So why does that work? Right? He had really nothing to go off of besides these analogies to things that he could observe. And I try to really dive into the story and think about how foreign planets must have seemed. Right? You're literally talking about different places than where their, ground, their feet were on the ground. And yet, he was not intimidated by that fact and think, well, there's no point to looking at how heat might work. It probably works completely different there. But because he thought about how... Um, different traits or chemical processes work that he could observe, he could think about how do those work in comparison to this and what can I learn from it? He didn't just create a great analogy like the Michael J. Fox one and say, this is good enough, I can finish, right? He says, uh, that was, I'm sorry. <laughs> he specifically unpacks it, right? He looks for how it can apply, discards it, and continues to move along. This power of analogy can really help us when we are too stuck in our thinking, which happens to all of us. Um, BCG specifically tried to get around this by, in 2001, they created this intranet site, a bit of a roulette situation where uh, you say you're working on mergers and acquisitions, and it would not just show you different mergers to look back on and how they worked, but specifically uh, would bring up William the Conqueror's merger of England with the Norman Kingdom. Canal, this would be where the Alexander Principle would come from as well. And it works. Uh, there was a study where they actually had MBA students create strategies for a fake company that was struggling to build revenue, and they were broken into these three groups. So one got no analogies, one got one within the same industry, and one got multiple distant, uh, from distant industries. Think about the William the Conqueror example. You can probably guess who won. Um, they measured this by how many strategies were created, and group three by far had the most. Group one had the fewest. But what was interesting to me is when they asked the students what they would take away from this, they said, well, I feel like maybe just one analogy within the industry is still probably best. Intuitively, it feels like we have more to learn from things happening within the same industry than what we could possibly learn there. 
but so much of these should build this impression that there are relationships that we can't feel or can't nat natively draw up that still are providing us with uh, so much information and how to act. So third, talk about how once you activate how to bring in range within yourself and within your decision making, how you can still improve upon that by bringing in multiple different people to continue that along. So um, psychologist Kevin Dunbar was researching the best run labs in the country, went on a listening tour to find out um, how the productive labs worked. So a fun situation happened. He watches two labs at the same time uncovering the same problem and gets to see how they work through them on their uh, download meetings. So in one lab, there's only E. coli experts. And in lab two, a uh, very diverse group of people from different backgrounds, not just chemistry, physics, medical backgrounds, and genetics. Again, you can probably guess. But he brings up uh, the fact that those with able to draw from a number of different experiences were able to quickly identify this from how they worked with medical devices, and they solved it in the same meeting. The other group tried to use their E. coli knowledge to deal with everything, and it took them weeks to uncover a solution. So it helped speed up the process, even though it seems like it would be divergent, uh, would be quick to shut down in a meeting as irrelevant. And once you see examples of this, of people bringing experiences from outside what your problem solving is, you can't stop seeing it. These are my circles, right? This came from uh, the Wall Street Journal. Again, thank you. Um, what magic is this? Has anyone been to Uniglow? Thank you. Have, oh, sorry, and done the self-checkout? Okay, yeah, it's incredibly cool. You go, you put these clothes in your bag, you drop them into this square, sorry, this square container, and it just goes 8634. You pay and you're on your way and you're just like, this is the future. This must be the newest, coolest technology. But what it actually came from is while so many people, so many consulting firms have been trying to solve self-checkout from the idea of how do we replace the cashier, the CIO of Fast Retailing, which is their parent company, was instead you know, used to trying to solve problems with their logistics and distribution and was like obsessed with RFID tags. And he looked at it from the question of how do we measure or, or how do we track how our um, products are moving from our store and to out of the store. And he's like, well, we have a solution for that. 10 cent RFID tags and 20 year old radar technology. This was the opposite of the cutting edge, but by reframing the problem and bringing in, you know, he's a CIO, so it's not like he was brought in. But uh, by bringing in people from different backgrounds and encouraging um, others to actually help you solve the problem, it really can help breach these uh, long standing solutions, which everyone's been to a self checkout aisle. They're not that fun. You can actually operationalize it. There are whole companies, though, that try to specifically provide this outside knowledge coming into these long standing problems. One is Kaggle, they focus on machine learning. This is through a group called Inocentive that they, they said, write to us your problems that you cannot solve in your lab or your company and we'll just send it out to the group and crowdsource it. This was my favorite example. So the Exxon Valdez oil spill had happened decades ago as, as is today. And they still have these recovery barges that are supposed to take the remnants of it and get and dispose of it. But because of the environment, uh, which would be the cold in Alaska, the water, this oil remnants turn into this peanut butter type solution that gets stuck and they have not been able to figure out how to change that chemical balance to get it. A chemist responds and not with, uh, from Ohio, I don't know if that matters, but um, go Buckeyes. The, <laughs> he did not solve it with his knowledge of chemistry. Instead it was, he was helping his brother-in-law finish uh, a stairwell going down a hillside. And as part of that, they were building the foundation and they were sending concrete from the very top to the very bottom in a very hot place like we would be here and started to get concerned and was like, this concrete's gonna dry out and then it will be useless. And his brother just comes, brother-in-law comes up with this stick that just vibrates aggressively, puts it in the concrete and just goes whoosh. So he's like, you guys should just put that thing on a boat. And that was the solution. 30 years, and this one guy who had built a stairwell was like, oh, yeah. It's so easy to assume. 
if you were telling someone this situation and they're like, well, I built a stairwell, uh, have you ever done this? It would seem so irrelevant, but that's where the psychological safety comes in, right? And the other thing is uh, how to do this correctly. Knowledge is a double-edged sword. It will allow you to do one thing, but it will be blind to the other things you can do. This is the problem of just uh, working from one angle consistently. You just forget what other relationships could be there. About, I, well, I don't even remember when I started my career, but there was a big thing at the time. It was the idea of starting to hire for unicorns because digital was changing the game. And they said you would no longer would need to look for people that just had a marketing background or a finance background or a product background, but you need people who can do that and can code your website at the same time and build you these applications. And I was very self-conscious because I did not know how to do any of those things at the time, but I do now. And I always think about that. Uh, you expect to have this beautiful beast walk into the room, <laughs> but, but this was me. <laughs> Babe, of course, was a wonderful movie about a pig with interpersonal skills um, <laughs> by the director of Mad Max, and it was great. But um, it wasn't, uh, honestly, the plot was very applicable. So uh, the pig, who was friendly to the sheep, was able to corral them and make them go uh, in the direction the farmer wanted compared to the sheep dogs who were just biting the sheep. But what I take away from this is like, OK, it's cool that pig uh, could speak. But the farmer was looking at this animal and being like, there's something different about this, but got over it and specifically brought him along to the wonderful sheep pig that he was. It's on us to build the unicorns, right? It is really hard to take someone that's um, coming from, I'll take one of the people from my team, coming from a mechanical engineering background and really wants to get into this, and then the first task you give them, you're like, mm, you don't know how to use a spreadsheet, you know? <laughs> you have to specifically take the strengths that they're giving you and give them time to develop it, to unlock that superpower and create that safety for them. So what have we learned from this? One, this meandering that we have matters, right? Many of us come from different backgrounds. Probably at some points we think that they were wastes, but at some point you're gonna draw from that knowledge. And I encourage you to take advantage of the people from the different industries. Nobody likes the person that you say, oh yeah, I work from One North, and then they'll be like, well, let me tell you how to run an agency. But if you're telling them how, what some of the problems are that you uncover, and they start to tell you some problems that from their own industry, so that's the time to listen. They start to tell you the problems they're having with T-ball or with an engine. Those are the times to listen. Again, this weekend I read something, and it was talking about Howard Schultz uh, and his relationship with the new CEO of Starbucks. Howard Schultz had been, and I'm sorry, I uh, struggled to pronounce his name, but I, he, Howard Schultz had been going around to football training camps and was enthralled with how those different teams break them into different divisions and then bring them back together and work to solve some of their problems. And was trying to figure out, hey, like maybe we could bring some of this to our management training, to which the new CEO replied, Howard, this is a business, not football. That's a great example of psychological safety, because if you can feel confident shutting down Howard Schultz, <laughs> I feel like, now he might be very successful, so I don't want to throw bets down. Remember, that's not my, that's, I might be a hedgehog, I don't remember. The, the point is, you have to create these spaces. So number two, design thinking led workshop is not, a lot, not enough. We've been creating a lot of new tools to specifically get to this point. Design thinking workshops are supposed to be blue sky, bringing up things, finding relationships together. But it's so rare that someone's gonna stand up and say, I worked at Potbelly's one time and when we did our sandwich line, we did it this way and for people to take them seriously. Psychological safety, you know, remember that for the drinking game, is incredibly important to this process. People need to feel that they can bring uh, experiences from outside that industry if you actually want to take advantage of your diverse workforce. And third, knowing that technology is not going to, do, not going to be enough. On the other hand, I would say we need to embrace this. Our backgrounds are going to be such an asset when we learn how to apply AI or any of the other new technologies 
to our organizations. We have experiences that will matter because we have learned universal rules from them that we'll be able to apply. Thank you. All right, Ben, thank you. Any questions for Canal Data Guy to Data Guy? What do you got for him? Can you hear me? In terms of heuristics that we just heard earlier and AI, do you see these two actually coming together? Yes, um, but that's too, I, yes, but I don't know how. Um, <laughs> so I was thinking a lot about when Kalav was presenting about how a lot of what these analogies are doing as pointed out by what system two thinking is. Uh, this pushes into system two and why that would apply to more complex questions. I think there's, it's a weird collaboration there because one of the things I'm excited about with AI is it should be able to pick up on the complex patterns. That's the story of Jim Simons, right? So we have this two-way street, one with, I really wanna use AI to go through different heuristics and solve the 90% issue, but also not assume that it can't handle some of these. Um, but I don't really know how to, square that circle yet in an answer that's interesting. All right, thank you, Ben. Thank you. Thank you.